this is the first time we're actually going live in probably about four or five months. Uh, we're obviously in a totally different market than we were four or five months ago. I'm wearing my first suit for the first time in four or five months. I actually had a look online on how to tie my tie, joking. But this is gonna be, there's gonna be two types of videos. This one is gonna be the expectations over the coming year, which everyone has been considering. You know, what do I do, Charles? Okay, so this is the expectations within real estate, and then I'm gonna have a separate video, which is about buyers, sellers, landlords, investors, renters, and then break down each, because each one is completely different within this market right now. There's a lot of misinformation going out there, okay? There is things that the media will take, and then they'll put out, because it's it's flashy, it's good, but the thing is, it's one data point. And then if you only have one data point, everybody knows that it shouldn't be actually characterized as truth because it's just one data point, okay? One experience, and then they say the entire market is like that. I'm in the thick of it. I'm actually very busy with buyers and listings, so I have a very good grasp on both concepts, and I'm having conversations with all types of people, whether it's a buyer, it's a seller, and it's an investor, it's an owner, it's someone that wants to buy in the future, it's someone that's renewing their lease. So first, let's just go into the expectations. Everyone pretty much knows a lot of this, but I'm just gonna solidify it because I've been thinking about it before and then we opened up on phase two in real estate and it's kind of just made it concrete where everyone is going all right so number one is there's going to be a massive consolidation in real estate okay so consolidation i mean the big brokerages they're either going to be closing offices they're going to be joining together or they're just going to be letting people go okay so the beginning of covid we were seeing all the big brokerages go i've been talking about this for years is that less transactions less commission percentages equals less income less profit but then their office space is still going up their overhead is still going up their marketing is still going up their employees salaries and benefits are still going up so business 101 when you don't have a lot of profit and you have a lot of expenses i'm one of them i'm i had to pay for this office space for the last three four months even though i had no income okay the landlord was like i don't care you're in a lease you have to pay for it so all of the big brokerages if i take my small sample set and i multiply it across dozens of offices or thousands of agencies you're going to see we already saw Corcoran and City Habitats join together we recently just saw Brown Howard Stevens and Halstead join together personally I think it's a good thing because you're bringing resources of say marketing or technology together so instead of and by the way both of them were owned by parent companies Terra Holdings owned uh, Brown Howard Stevens and Halstead so why not join it together why compete yes there are two different markets you know Brown Howard Stevens was more of the old school we've been around for over 100 years and Halstead is more of that innovative where I was kind of flair but if you bring that together and you have the the recognition the brand of both and then you have the the old kind of traditional just good values of Brown Harris Stevens and you bring it together who's to say that's not going to be successful right now we're going to see the consolidation that I've been looking for or I've been talking about for a while and this is coming down I already said from percentages and less transactions so we used to average about 12,000 transactions now we're about to do about 10,000 transactions 6% 7% commissions listing in apartments sometimes uh, in the past now it's about 6% 5% you know some people are even doing uh, no fee in other words, I'm sorry, no percentage, but a set fee, 2,500, which was purple brick or something like that. They failed in New York City because New York City is totally different. We're an arbitrary market because we have condos and co-ops and we don't have this put your home on the market, put a sign outside and we can close in a week if we're cash kind of suburbs deal. So we're going to see a lot more consolidation. Number one, number two, we're going to see a lot less agents in the industry and we're going to see a lot less offices within the residential community. Personally, I don't think the actual flair of having a ground floor office space is worth the amount of money. Money, but granted that's completely objective to whoever the business owner is number two we're gonna see larger homes okay there's been you know I've been talking with a lot of business owners and a lot of c-suite kind of executives you know at banks you know big banks big technology firms you know Mark Zuckerberg when he was talking to I think CNBC said he wants to in the next 10 years have 50% of the workforce or 70% of the workforce and he said it's not a goal but it's just something that he would love to achieve is that 60 to 70% of the workforce is work from home and the reason the benefit behind that is that he doesn't have to have someone move to San Francisco or New York City or Austin or Seattle where someone may not want to do that because they love their country life or they're really good in Omaha and they are their families there or they've already built their roots of I don't know tradition of a larger place land you know whatever 
they don't want to go to an apartment and deal with the hustle bustle of New York City. So he said he wants to tap into all that talent throughout the rest of the country that doesn't want to move to a larger city. So we're going to see in New York City, larger homes. So if you had a studio, you go to a one bedroom. If you had a one bedroom, you go to a two bedroom. And the reason being is obviously working from home. I think that's going to become sort of a new norm. You know, I was, I was talking to someone very high up, aka my brother, and he said that there's a trend from the people graduating from college is that they, they do not care as much for money as they do for the work-life balance, okay? So that's something that's kind of been thrown around as new agey kind of lifestyle, but now the Gen Z, is that what they are? Are coming up and saying, hey, listen, I actually want to work really hard for four days and take three days off, then work really hard for five days and have the weekend off or whatever the case is. So there's a rotation that he's seen. So in other words, two weeks on in the office, two weeks off at home but you're still working so this this whole hustle bustle might be changing i don't know it's not for everyone but we're seeing a trend towards that which brings up still on number two amenities people are going to want the gym in the building they're going to want the rooftop they're going to want the garden or the lounge so they can actually retire to something at the end of the night or at the end of the day if they're working from home or work from a lounge or work from a rooftop or or be on calls and be on the treadmill at home. So I see that as a big trend is that buildings with amenities are gonna be becoming popular again. Number three, we've already seen it. I've done a huge amount of referrals out to the suburbs, probably five in the last week and a half. New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Westchester, and Long Island, people are exiting to the suburbs. So essentially what COVID does did was, you know, exacerbate or at least fast forward the, the plans that people already had, whether they had a burgeoning family or they needed more space or they're done with the city or they were thinking about moving. They're saying, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to the suburbs. And there's, you know, people say it's a mass exodus. Listen, whether it's a mass exodus, we'll get to the renters, but the mass exodus are the people that wanted to buy or were already homeowners and going to buy in the suburbs, okay? So the people that I referred out to the suburbs were already a homeowner in New York City. So it's not renters buying, though there's probably gonna be some of those, it's homeowners that are buying. So they had a two bedroom, they wanted that outdoor space or the deck or the driveway, you know, whatever, the, the 30 year plan. So we're seeing a lot of that pricing along the Hudson Valley. Hudson Valley. So if you're in the tri-state area, there's obviously two sides of the Hudson Valley. You have the east side, which has all the train stops, Amtrak and Metro North. Those are exploding through the roof. An anecdotal uh, story that I have, I have a client that she has a place that's about hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half outside of New York City. It's not along the water. It's, it's probably a 20 minute, 30 minute drive to the water. In other words, the Hudson. And she said that her home would normally fetch about five to $6,000 a month. And actually no less, $4,000 a month. She put it up Airbnb, the per and she also put it up on Zillow for sale by owner. She got someone from Brooklyn to pay $8,000 a month. So double the price and said, you know what? I like this so much. I'm going to buy the home from you. So that's, you know, a lot of people that are saying, listen, I got my kids all day, every day. I need to get out of the apartment and you can't get out of the apartment if you want to go maybe to Prospect Park or Central Park or Riverside Park or Madison Square Park, whatever. But honestly, are you going to do that every single day? So they'd rather just go out to the backyard. So pricing in the suburbs are, you know, I, I had buyers that went into bidding wars. I had one that lost out on Long Island. He finally got a place on his second try. I had someone else. They lost out in New Jersey, Northern New Jersey, Fort Lee area. I have another friend that is going along the water, along the Hudson in the kind of West New York area, which is very exploding, it, or very exploding. It's been exploding because you could just take a ferry across the water. All right, getting to the one that uh, nobody wants to hear about, commercial. So obviously commercial, you have, I've been saying this for years and obviously I've been getting a lot of pushback because it was during good times, but we have overbuilt not only on the high end, very high end residentially, if you just go and you look north on in the 50s, high 50s, you have just an array of billionaires row that are going to sit vacant for many years, whether it's going to go to rentals, kind of like it was in the financial district in 2009, where all that office space, we're going to go to sales and then the recession hit and then they went to rentals. That's to be seen because those are very expensive places. So rentals are going to go for 20, 30, 40, $50,000. Downtown is more like 4,000, 5,000 rental, 4,000 or $5,000 per month rentals, but we're gonna see commercially, if you're looking at ground floor leases and you're walking around New York City, this is a 
crazy, just sandy, superstorm sandy kind of three things that have happened. Number one is COVID. Number two is civil unrest. And number three, it's an election year. So all three of those have just parlayed into ground floor business owners or even just office space owners and they're just either putting their hands up you know i'm in a building that has about 2100 businesses in it uh it's a co-working space and we're seeing you know i don't know the exact data but even just looking around my floor i'm one of the only people that are working every single day okay then i'm looking around and people are exiting so all the co-working spaces you know that are out there are you know, they're going to be tough. And then I also look across the way I have, you know, 40, 50 story buildings all around me. I'm in Bryant Park area, huge high rises. You know, my brother's at Deutsche Bank. He said that a lot of his building down on Wall Street is also becoming vacant. And I can see that across the board, especially technology. I know there's a lot of people that are going out to Hudson Yards like Amazon and Facebook. They're all going to Hudson Yards or Moynihan Station, which is right across from Penn Station. So it's going to be interesting how they're going to do that commercially, especially after what I just said with Mark Zuckerberg on CN CNBC saying he wants to move towards tapping all the talent throughout the country, working from home instead of coming into an office. So commercially, you have office space, which is going to be completely decimated. And the reason being is you, you still have the World Trade Center, World Financial Center. You have one, or one Vanderbilt, which is right near the uh, Grand Central Station. That's still being built right now. I think it's topped out. And then you also have Hudson Yards. So you have this overabundance of office space, let alone that's obviously class A, but then you also have B and C all around us that are going to be coming available. Price per square foot is just going to start just, just getting deteriorated. Also, if you look at it, services are going to increase. And really the only people that are going to be in ground floor, ground floor retail personally, and I've been saying this for a while, is going to be food. And it's going to be services. So it's going to be like nail salons or shoe shines or haircuts or things like that. In other words, buying knickknacks and things like that. I think that's going to be a lot online. It's going to probably rebound, but it's going to be in about 2022. Okay. Maybe the end of 2021. Okay. It's going to be not in the next year. Okay. Negatives to COVID. We're just going to go over this really quick because I know the attention span for everyone is just decimated right now. Negatives of COVID is, and this is obviously buying and or selling, this is in residential. So the negatives of COVID is that people may be that actually want to buy or sell are going to be want are going to be reluctant because they don't want people to come through their home or it's a big hassle to keep it clean and make sure it's sanitized. And also there's forms and disclosures in the co-op or condo have their own rules and regulations. So there's going to be a lot of people that actually do want to do something, but they're afraid to do something. Uh, number two, under the negatives, no open houses. So no open houses was a huge driver of people that were coming in from say New Jersey, Long Island, Connecticut, Westchester that said, Hey, listen, I'm going to hit a bunch of open houses. Those people are not going to come in for just one showing. They would usually just bang out about five open houses on a Sunday and then they would drive back and then put in an offer. Those are not happening. So that means the reduced amount of traffic into homes is going to be a big deal. So instead of 15, 20 inquiries on a home, we'll only get about five. Number three is kind of that fun interactive that you get with going to, going to open houses, smiling, uh, meeting and greeting agents and homes and other people and talking in the elevator and doormen and the, the whole the whole experience of buying is totally different now because sometimes me as a buyer's agent, I can't even be there. It's just a listing agent. You can't talk, you can't shake hands, you're kind of bowing, you're giving elbows, you have a face mask, you have to do disclosures, you can't see the amenities. So that whole experience is kind of gone, all right? It will come back. Don't worry about it. We just have to get through this time. Homes that are purely on video look a lot smaller. I've done FaceTime, tons of FaceTime showings, and it looks very small. And then when you do wide angle, it looks like it's even smaller. And countertops that are about five or six feet look about one or two feet. So that's not good. The positives of COVID, if there are any in real estate, is that you're not going to have any people that are just window shopping. The people that are seeing homes are serious about seeing homes, okay? No one's gonna go through signing disclosures, putting on a mask, going in, not having their buyer's agent, not shaking hands, and just window shopping. That's not happening. So anyone that actually sees a home is very serious about buying, which is really good. So you just knock everybody out. Also, number two is the property tour. Finally, a property tour, which I've been doing for eight or nine years, consistently on every single property, 
is going to become the norm is that property tours because the thing before is that you could kind of white out the windows that look at a brick wall or you can kind of doctor the photos so it looks brighter or bigger or wide angle lens but in a video tour you're going to say oh this is actually not that good because over the agent's shoulder you'll see that's a brick wall or that's ground floor level or that's looking at mechanicals or something like that so the positives is that there's going to be property tours on every single one. And I think that's only a good thing because it narrows down the list. Obviously, any home that's on the market, the owner is serious. The owner is serious. These are the people that you want to place offers because no owner is actually putting their home on the market, potentially below what they want, unless they actually want to sell their property. So any home that you see on the market, especially new development, you could see some really good deals in new development. That's going to be really good to potentially get some prices. By the way, 2018, it's already started to slide. 2020, too much inventory, pricing started to slide, and now we're just in 2020. So, you know, people say, can I put 10% below the asking price? Yeah, it depends, but also know that it's far below the height of 2017, 2016. Moving on is the services that an agent has to bring is going to increase or else you're not going to survive. So in other words, if you're an agent, you have to provide better services because everything's gonna be online. Everything is gonna be done remotely. Even putting in board packages, even meeting with, you know, say board members or, you know, questions that you would have is all gonna be PDF or scanned or e-signed or video or pictures or anything. So in other words, the actual skills of a real estate agent is gonna to have to increase, which obviously you know is really good for consumers. And the last thing is, personally, I think all of this is gonna be behind us. The market is gonna fully recover, not fully Fully recover to pricing of 2016 2017 but it's going to fully recover where people will have open houses be excited no mass shaking hands getting back into the experience being more confident in the real estate agent next spring next fall so it's going to be a year out but by that time people are going to be like thank god we all went through it it's kind of like 2009 it's so similar to 2009 it's it's crazy and then i'm about to do a video on a market update for buyers sellers renters landlords investors and i'm going to go into new development as well because i have a lot of buyers that are also looking at new development. So that's going to be a separate video. If you guys have any questions, if you have any comments, or if you want to add something to the video, definitely leave it below. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, charles at botenston.com. And of course, we're going to be putting out a lot of a lot more videos because people are yearning for the actual, I see that Fox, CN, C, CNBC or Fox Business or MSNBC, all of these kind of talking heads are not actually dialing it down to the consumer. I'm in the trenches. I'm talking to the buyers. I'm talking to the sellers. I'm talking to the management company. I'm seeing the pricing. I'm seeing the contracts. I'm seeing the accepted offers. I'm seeing the rejected offers. Those people are not. They're just taking data that's a month old and just spewing it out for clickbait or headlines. So just know they don't have your best interest at heart and maybe they do, but they may not be correct, all right? And I'll just give you this last, last point. We put in an offer yesterday, the pre-approval letter that came through, 2.875, 2.875 30 year interest rate. That's crazy. Have an amazing day. I will be talking to you guys soon. Again, if you have any questions, leave in the comments below.